Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach. We have the pleasure today of having Ali, a medical student from Iraq, who is going to do the first groundbreaking Grand Rounds from Iraq. We hope it's a regular uh, presentation. And before we meet Ali, let's go around to the panelists to see. Uh, okay, the panelists. Ahmed, are you are you there, Ahmed? He may have stepped away. Yeah, uh, now I have to start. Uh, none, hold on. Uh, let me see if uh, there's a couple of panelists. I don't know. If uh, okay. Tuka, Tuka, are you there? Uh, Be uh, Bethany, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yes, could you please introduce yourself? And put your picture on uh, if you can. If, if you can, you got a, you got a picture there, oh, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, you're not on there. You're not on, your face is not on yet. There you go. Oh, there no. you go. We want people to meet you. Yeah, just tell us about uh, yourself and uh, where, where you're practicing. Is... Okay. Go ahead. Okay, my name is Ahmed. Uh, I'm a of Ali. I'm a medical uh, student uh, at the University of Baghdad, uh, third grade. I'm now uh, present, uh, participate with you to because Ali is my best friend and I attend this lecture. Very, very good. Welcome, Ahmed. Okay, I guess we'll meet the other panelists later. Okay, uh, Ali, welcome. And why don't you just briefly introduce yourself and uh, then on with your presentation and welcome. Hello, John. How are you? So uh, I close my uh, mute. Okay, right now. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Mohammed. I am a fourth grade uh, medical student at College of Medicine, University of Baghdad, here in Iraq. And I am super highly interested of the neurosurgery department as my future career or my future uh, specialty. And today we will present uh, our lecture here, uh, the spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage for non-neurosurgeon. I hope so. We will get the benefit and have some fun together. Very good. Okay, on to your presentation. Okay, uh, now we will start? Sure. Okay, I will share it. Right now. Is it clear for all of you? Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, now we will start our presentation here. So our objective for this lecture, uh, we will know what is the subarachnoid space and know what is the definition of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. We'll know what are the causes, the risk factor, and also the epidemiology for this disease. And also we have to know how is the presentation of the patient to our ER with uh, spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage, how to diagnose it, we have to know what is the complication and we have to control and manage uh, this uh, condition and know the real treatment for this. Uh, at the end, we will know some facts about the brain aneurysm and simple quizzes. Uh, we will show it as demonstration for a teaching way, okay? Now we will start. Here, as we see all, uh, as we all know, the brain is a highly socialized organ located inside the skull and surrounded by the meninges, as we see here, the pia matter, the arachnoid matter, and the dura matter, right? So when we're going to talk about the subarachnoid space, it means the space that's located between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. So when we're going to say there is subarachnoid hemorrhage, it means what? It means there is subarachnoid here in this space, bleeding or hemorrhage between the pia matter and the arachnoid matter. Is that the full definition for the subarachnoid hemorrhage? No. So let's to know together what are the causes for the subarachnoid hemorrhage, right? When you're going to talk about the subarachnoid hemorrhage, we can categorize them into two categories. The first one is the traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is the most common cause for subarachnoid hemorrhage from head trauma, RTA, and et cetera. But it's not the title for our subject today. So what is our title? It's the spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage, right? We choose this title because it uh, comes with different presentation, with many complications. And this one, the spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage, come from many causes. The first one, the most important one, it's count like 85% of the spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's intracranial ruptured aneurysm, as we see here. 
it's like 85%, maybe 90% of the spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage. And maybe there's other causes like uh, arterial venous malformation, tumor beds, um, uh, cerebral arterial dissection, rats, and etc. for the causes, right? So now we know it's the spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage come mostly from the ruptured aneurysm, right? So what is the ruptured aneurysm? What is, what is the anteracranial aneurysm? We're going to talk about the aneurysm. It means that there is a weakness in the blood vessel wall, maybe artery or vein, almost artery. And this weakness will lead to a punch, like a ballon, like a ball, extravasation of the vessel. This punch, like we see here, named as aneurysm. And the aneurysm has many types, or we can say or uh, classify it according to the shape, like we see here, fusiform aneurysm, saccular aneurysm, and this saccular aneurysm, or the berry aneurysm, it looks like the sac, right? Uh, this one, maybe it will rupture, this one mostly the ruptured one, and lead to the ruptured aneurysm that cause that subarachnoid hemorrhage, right? Here, you will see this angiogram of a saccular aneurysm here. Other angio for the very, uh, sorry, for the fusiform aneurysm. And here for this picture, we will show and demonstrate some of the physiological point about the aneurysm. We maybe use it to know the basics of the aneurysm. The aneurysm usually uh, will be with the blood flow direction, as we see here. This is the blood flow direction, this is the aneurysm. It also being at branching point, we have to look for this point, branching point, also surrounding by small perforators, perforating artery, right? In this picture, we're looking for other saccular aneurysm in the angio, saccular aneurysm, fusiform one, and other pathological pictures. Now we know what is the aneurysm, which is the most cause, or the mostly causes of the spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now we will look for the classification of the sites of the aneurysm, the most common site for the aneurysm. Um, when we're going to look for the site for the aneurysm, let's do a quick revision for the circle of Willis that we also know. Um, for the circle of Willis, as we know, here two vertebral arteries come here and to form the basal artery, and this the posterior cerebral artery, and this also the posterior circulation. Here we have two uh, internal carotid artery uh, here in the bifurcation point to uh, lead to the middle cerebral artery here laterally and here in the middle, in the midline, we look for the anterior cerebral artery and which also communicated by the anterior communicating artery. So when we're going to talk about what are the most common sites for the ruptured aneurysm, we'll talk about branching point as we said before, right? So the most common site for the ruptured aneurysm is here in the ACOM anterior communicating artery, here in the anterior circulation. Maybe it will be here. Uh, for this demonstration, we see that 40% is the anterior carotid artery, like it's the most common one, but the, the most of the resources said that is the anterior communicating artery is the most common site for the rupturing aneurysm or for the aneurysm. The second common site here, here, and the PCOM or the posterior circulation maybe. The third common site is here in the middle cerebral artery at branching point between the M1 and the M2, the first branch or the second branch or the middle cerebral artery. And then we will look for the posterior circulation. It's, it's count like 10 to 15% of the uh, percent of the aneurysm. Now we all know what are the aneurysm, where is where it should be located, what is the most common site for it. So who are at risk to have a ruptured aneurysm? Who are at risk to have a spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage? Let's to think about the vascular disease. Uh, as we know, aneurysm, it's vascular abnormality, so it looks like the vascular disease, right? So what are the risk factors for the vascular disease? Maybe hypertension? Yeah, sure. Smoking, alcohol? Absolutely. Family history, sure, age, advanced age, all of that things, it's a risk factor for vascular disease and also it's a risk factor for aneurysm, for uh, formation of the aneurysm and for rupturing of the aneurysm. And there is other two uh, really important uh, causes or 
risk factors, we can say, here, adult polycystic kidney disease and other connective tissue diseases like uh, Allardello syndrome, as we know. And when we are going to say it uh, come from a family history or it come from adult polycystic kidney disease, which is also a familiar disease, so there is a high risk to formation of what? Of multiple aneurysms. So when we look for a patient with, which have multiple aneurysm, not a single one, that we will have a prediction of maybe this one has a family history or, or a familiar disease like adult polycystic kidney disease. And other, from, other risk factor is not demonstrated here in this slide. Maybe the ethnic group, like in Finland, like in Japanese, they have high risk for the, for the aneurysm and for the rupture of the aneurysm, which will lead to the spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is our uh, title for this lecture. And here we look for uh, this table. It's certified our talking here. This table uh, talking about the risk factor of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, this is taken from uh, Medical Emergency uh, Handbook, which is at uh, Italy. Now, the most important things of our lecture to look for the presentation of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. How is the patient of the subarachnoid hemorrhage come to our ER and we have to increase our level of suspicion that this patient has subarachnoid hemorrhage? The first important thing of, of the presentation or the sign or symptoms is sudden severe headache. It's important to sudden and severe. The severity, we can say it is the worst headache in my life. Um, maybe this patient have a, a series of previous attack of headache. He will say this headache is different. It is the worst headache in my life and it's sudden. Maybe we will see uh, in 50% 50, uh, 50 of the patient, there is decreasement of the level of the consciousness. Why? It makes sense because there is increase in the intracranial pressure. And when there is increase of the intracranial pressure, so that will lead to the decrease the level of the consciousness, right? Maybe we'll see a focal deficit. Absolutely. Maybe you'll see attack of seizure because of the irritation. Maybe you'll see a photophobia, increasement of the high blood pressure. Maybe you'll see oculomotor palsy because there is a compression according to the size and the size of that hemorrhage. And what are we going to say else? Um, maybe we'll see nausea and vomiting. Yeah. And maybe we'll see a fever. So nausea and vomiting, a fever and headache. Okay, photophobia, right? And neck stiffness, yeah. Nausea, vomiting, headache, fever, neck stiffness, photophobia, all of that come with the sign of meningitis. Yeah, this is meningitis. And this is the most common misdiagnosis mistake that we fall with a patient with a spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage, that we think of him as, as a patient with meningitis. And because we all know how meningitis is common and it's more cannily than the subarachnoid hemorrhage, so we fall in this bad diagnosis. And 50% of the subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, patients will die after one month if left untreated. So if we go with this misdiagnosis and maybe using of antibiotics for antibiotics for many weeks, that maybe will lead for death of this patient. So how we can avoid this misdiagnosis? How we can increase our level of suspicion? For this patient that he had a uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. First, we have to look for the history. There is sudden severe headache. It is something happens suddenly, not something gradually. Like the meningitis, there is something come and there is something after it will come. Like for example, nausea and vomiting. After that, we will see that fever, maybe gradually in onset in the increase of the fever, and then we will see the next stiffness. So the history give us the indication. The second thing, we will look for the age. Uh, meningitis, maybe it will come with uh, children, right? But uh, for the subarachnoid hemorrhage, it's rarely come in the pediatric age group. Is that the, the way to avoid it? No, you have to send your patient for the non contrast CT. Wait, you're, you're saying to send this patient for the non contrast CT in the emergency department, which is second line of treatment or second line of investigation in the emergency. Yeah. Here with subarachnoid hemorrhage, there's exception to send the patient for the non contrast CT, whatever it was that, that the case. Okay. 
So now we know how to avoid this misdiagnosis. So how to diagnose the patient with a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Yeah, uh, as we said, we will look for the history first, and then we will look for non-contrast CT. Why non-contrast? Because uh, we will look for the hyperdensity and the bleeding. So we, so we will look for non-contrast CT, uh, which it has sensitivity like 95%. And then uh, we, will, we will see and uh, look for the hyperdensity region or the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Then we will send the patient for the angiogram. And when you talk about the angiogram, maybe it will CT angio, MRI angio, catheter angio, whatever it was, but we commonly use the CT angio because it uh, uh, commonly used uh, fast and uh, cost effective and uh, come in a few minutes maybe. So uh, that's the angio to look for the exact size of this aneurysm and its size to decide the, the best treatment for it. There is uh, 5% false negative in the CT. So the books said that we have to look for the LP at lumbar fracture. The lumbar fracture, we will get sample and look for like this, blood, 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 and here look light yellow. This yellow one, because it's, it's look uh, xantachromia, we can say. This xantachromia is come from uh, hemoglobin, destroyed to be a bilirubin, so it looked like yellow in shape. But this, uh, this is not applicable in our, in our daily practice because as we all know, uh, the LP, it's really invasive procedure. So we do our best to diagnose this patient of subarachnoid hemorrhage with this uh, investigation for the CT and for the angio. Now we will look together and see how we can look for the picture of or, or the radiology of the patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage. I will suspect that the, the the viewer that they know the basics of the radiology here. So this is axial section for non-contrast uh, CT. Here we look for this black area, which is hypodensity. Uh, this hypodensity area because it's filled with the CSF because it's called the cistern. It's like a sac of a CSF. So we will look for this region. It's called the basal cistern. It's, it's okay to know it's just the basal cistern, but if you want to uh, get more advantage here, this region called the supraciliary cistern, that below it, it's called the antropedunkal cistern. Here is the ambient cistern, here is quadrigenal cistern. All of that called the basal cistern. Here we will look here and here, laterally on the both side, it's the sylvian fissure, or maybe you call it the lateral sulcus. Um, but it's the sylvian fissure here we used in the neurosurgery. Um, the sylvian fissure, it's the way that the middle cerebral artery move. Salcas separated the frontal lobe from the uh, temporal lobe here. And here in the midline, we will look for the interhemispheric fissure. All of that the demonstration was a normal CT, to look for the normal CT scan that demonstrate that uh, sylvian and the internal hemispheric and the basal sister. So now we have to increase our suspicion how it will look that subarachnoid hemorrhage on the non-contrast CT. It looks like this, hyper density, star shape like this, this is star, on the basal sister filled with the blood, on the here for the sylvian fissure and here in the anterior hemispheric fissure. Interhemispheric fissure in the midline give us suspicion about acon ruptured aneurysm, anterior cerebral artery aneurysm, because it's located in the midline, right? As we do the revision for the circle of solids. This two sides, like the sylvian fissure here, as we know, sylvian fissure have the middle cerebral artery, and it makes sense, middle cerebral artery and the circle of solids go laterally. And for the basal system, give, that, give us a suspicion about the posterior circulation ruptured aneurysm, right? We look here, right, uh, because we will look for the left side, it means the right, hyperdensity in the uh, sylvian fissure, give us indication about ruptured aneurysm in that middle cerebral artery, maybe. To confirm it, we have to look for the angio to confirm this, uh, this pathology, right? Other cases here blood fold in the sylvian here, 
and huge hyper density in the intrahemispheric tissue give us indication of subarachnoid hemorrhage. This one here, we are looking for another case uh, here in Iraq and uh, Baghdad uh, Neurosurgery Teaching Hospital. Also, subarachnoid hemorrhage in the interhemispheric and in the sylvian fissure. Now, um, as we're talking about the, the subarachnoid hemorrhage radiology, so let's to look together to how to differentiate it from other uh, subarachnoid, uh, from other intracranial uh, hemorrhage for the subdural or maybe the epidural uh, hematomas. To, like we're saying, we are covering all the intracranial hematomas uh, on the CT, which is really essential for us in the emergency department. So when we're going to talk about the extradural hematoma here, extradural, it means outside of the dura. And we all know the dura, it is the hardest part of the meninges that, that's surrounding the brain. So when it will be extra of the dura, that means it will be, have like clear margin, defined margin or line like this because it will be cutched by the dura outside, right? It will look like the lemon, we can say lemon sign, and it will be biconvex against the side, against the direction of the brain. Here is the brain, here, and it will be in this direction, against it, right? So this is the epidural uh, hematoma. And we're looking for the subdural hematoma here, uh, we can say it will be, Subdural, so the hardest part of the of the of the meninges that catch the the, the bleeding, it will be sub it below it. So it will not be in defined margin or defined line like the epidural, and it will be like the banana sign. You can say it uh, will be like the crescent shape and etc. So let's do diagnose together how we can look for the pictures or the radiology of these cases. Here, it's uh, nine cross city and axial section here. We're looking for this hyperdensity area. Um, this hyperdensity area, we can look for it. Clear, defined margin here, right? Against the, the direction of the brain, and it's not like banana, we can say. So this is the epidural uh, or extradural hematoma. Here, it's, uh, we can say, uh, substitution injury. We can look here, here. Here we look like clear, clear margin and against the uh, direction of the brain and it look, not look like um, a banana sign <laughs> come with the lemon, we can say, right? So this extra dural hematoma, it is the most serious one because here it means it look on the temporal lobe, that is the boundaries of the middle cranial fossa. So this here it look on the temporal lobe. And the most serious uh, extradural hematoma uh, located on the temporal lobe because it will uh, do a pressure on inside our brain and inside our the brain stem that will lead the bradycardia. And here we can see uh, that is uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage also. Maybe there is a fracture here. All of these things uh, shown in this uh, case. Now for this picture, we look here. It's not clear margin, as we say, because it's below the dura in the subdural region. It's not, it's come with the direction of the brain, right? It's come in this direction, right? So it's come with subdural hematomas, right? Now you have to ask yourself, what is this? And you will listen for the answer from me, like we are asking and answering. I will look for this one. It is, what you can say? I'm gonna say it's, extradural hematoma because clear margin against the direction of the brain and uh, we can say uh, biconvex shape, right? When we look for this one, um, for this one, not clear margin, come with the direction with the brain, so it come with sub subdural hematoma, right? For this one, it's not like the other cases that we looked, right? Not like the subarachnoid, not like the epidural, not like the subdural, so it is intracerebral hemorrhage, ICH, right? On the most common side, which is the basal ganglia, right? So now we will show uh, other demonstration. You have to ask yourself now, what is this picture? 
what is this picture? Um, it's come with our demonstration. It's not like the epidural, not like the subepidural. Now we look here, hyperdensity here, here, come with a star shape, right? So it is subarachnoid hemorrhage. And maybe uh, we look for hyperdensity in the anterohemispheric fissure and the sylvian fissure. So that's come with maybe ruptured MCA or icon. That's we will uh, certify with the angel, right? Now I look for this case. It's really a challenge here in the Baghdad Neurosurgery uh, Teaching Hospital. Um, 34 years old male come to our uh, emergency department. The Glasgow was elevent. Um, he had a left side weakness with upper limbic grade zero, lower limbic grade, uh, sorry, upper limbic grade uh, one, lower limbic grade zero. And we operated him in 11 hour. For this case, for, for this one, in uh, ICH, intracerebral hemorrhage. But, um, sorry, uh, but uh, we look here and we see that hyper uh, density here, maybe it's come with the sylvian fissure. So we suspect this patient maybe have a ruptured aneurysm. And when we operate him for the ICH, we see, yeah, it has a ruptured aneurysm and we, we did that, the clipping for it. Now, uh, after we looking for the CT, so let's to look together for, for the angio. Um, to look for the angio here, um, we will uh, do the quick revision that we did before. Um, but now, these are uh, two vertebral arteries come together to form that basal artery, right? And here we look for the posterior uh, cerebral. This is the posterior circulation. Here is the internal carotid, uh, the cervical, petros, cavernous segmented here. And here we are looking for the bifurcations of the internal carotid artery, right? It's come here laterally, as we said, to, to form that middle cerebral artery with these branches, M1, M2, M3, and M4. And here we look for the anterior cerebral artery, right? And here is the ACOM, the part of the communication at your communicating artery, right? And this is the, the names for these arteries. Here we can see this punch, this case, uh, real case here in uh, our, our hospital. This is a ruptured middle cerebral artery aneurysm in the end of the M1 and the beginning of the M2. As we said before, in the branching point, which is the normal physiology of the aneurysm, right? Other CT angio from this section, we look here, tunnel carotid, come here laterally, so it's come with the middle cerebral one, right? And we can look here, there is ruptured aneurysm in the middle cerebral artery. And we can see in other cases, another angio, and this case uh, come with uh, ruptured aneurysm. Here we, we can see hyperdensity in the interhemispheric and in the sylvian fissure. We will confirm the diagnosis or the specific site of this aneurysm and the size with the angio, right? Now, another case, this case has a multiple aneurysm. As we said, when we look for a multiple aneurysm, we have to look for what? Maybe this patient has, um, we can say increasing risk of familiar diseases, adult polycystic kidney disease, because this abnormality come maybe with a multiple aneurysm. So here we look for this one and this one. It's not really clear demonstration of the angio, but we can say, I, I, I think it is internal carotid artery aneurysm and the middle cerebral artery one. Now we know the imaging, we know how is, how is the presentation of the patient with the ruptured intracranial aneurysm for our ER. We know how to diagnose him, how to, to avoid the misdiagnosis. Now we will look for how to do the grading for these cases. We have here two grading scales, which called the Hunt and Hess, H and H, and the Weffen. Um, not, we'll not uh, come with the details of that things, but this uh, grading, grading scales come with good prognosis or bad prognosis. So when we come with a grade one or a grade two, it means we have a good prognosis for, for, the, for the surgery. So go, go do the surgery, maybe do the clipping for it. 
and maybe grade three, four, five, it means there is bad prognosis. So we will look for other options, right? Uh, for a grade one, like here in Wefford, grade one, it's been the Glasgow 15, the best Glasgow. Grade two, meaning Glasgow 30 or, or 40, um, 13 or 14, sorry, uh, without your motor deficit, okay? Grade three, it means 13 or 14 with a motor deficit, and so on. That's how we can grading this, this aneurysm. And we're looking here with the hand and head scale, it's according to the presentation of the patient. If he was a mild headache for like a grade one, severe headache, maybe it will come with a confusion, focal deficit, and we look with the grade five, there is disturb uh, rate. It's mean brain death. That, so that means really, really bad prognosis for the surgery, right? Um, when we're looking here in this table, the third grading scale is Fisher scale, and there is modified Fisher scale also. This grading scale we look for the radiology, we look for the CT scan of this patient. And when we look for the CT scan, give us indication or give, the, give us indication for the risk of one of the most common and one of the most severe complication of the aneurysm, which is the vasospasm. We will talk about it later when we're going to talk about that complication, but we have to know the Fisher scale, give us indication of suspicion about the risk of the vasospasm, which is really, really serious complication. So now, now we finishing our scale, we will look for the complication. We put the complication here before we will talking about the treatment or the management, because we'll put our line of treatment according to these complications. We have to put in our mind, there is two important, two most common, two most serious complications. We have to put it really in our mind. And the other complications, we will look for it after that, according to the case. The first one is the ray bleeding, and the second one is the vasospasm. They are the most common complication and the most serious complication. The others, it look like making sense, right? Hydrocephalus, yeah, hydrocephalus makes sense because it's subarachnoid hemorrhage located in the cistern, so it's a sac of CSF, right? So it will be filled, so the CSF will come back to the ventricles, and with that, it will lead to the hydrocephalus, right? Hypertension. Yeah, it's, it's, also, uh, it's also come with these cases. Seizures, also because increasing of the intracranial pressure. There is systemic complication we have to put in our mind, like cardiac abnormalities, ECG changes, maybe uh, looking for uh, a sudden MI, and maybe we'll see pulmonary azima or pulmonary embolism. Then, maybe there is hypernatremia or hypovolemia. Sure, because there is bleeding so mean that hypo volumia it's come with this right and look for the hyperthermia and sepsis this according to case and we will manage it according to the case but we have to put in our mind the re-bleeding and the vasospasm all of our control and management our treatment will based on it okay so according to this complication we'll do all treatment and management Control and management for this patient. It's not the real treatment, it is the control and management. Like we, we receive the patient in the ER, so we will try to save him and make him alive. Okay? It's not the real treatment, how we control him. We look for this slide and we see a huge uh, lines, many lines, so let's to simplify them. First, as any, any, any patient come to the ER, we have to make the bed rest and administration for him. We have to make arterial line to control the hemodynamic circulation and for the hemostasis. We have to intubate the patient if he was unable to breathe or if he was unconscious, right? And then we will look for the most important things. This too, and the bold uh, type of or style of typing. We have to do blood pressure control. Blood pressure control to make it below 140, right? This thing to prevent them or to manage, not the real prevention for the most common complication, which is the ray bleeding. Because it makes sense. When there is high blood pressure, there is high risk of rupture, aneurysm, and do the ray bleeding, right? So you lose, uh, use this uh, beta blockers, right? And then we will look for that nemodipine or nemodipine. 
um, which is a calcium channel blocker. You'll lose uh, 60 uh, milligram uh, per or uh, with every four hour to prevent the second most complication, which is the vasospasm. But you have to be worried about the blood pressure, not to make it fall down. Look for the hypotensive, and then it, it means there is a risk of ischemia, right? Uh, now we'll look for the uh, intracranial pressure. Maybe it will be increased, as we said. So there is many of monitoring for it. There is cardiac monitoring for it. If there is seizures, prophylaxis, when it comes for, with a seizure, we can use an algesic and antimetic drug that's come to uh, prevent the increasement of the intracranial pressure and uh, for the comfortability of the patient. Stool softening that comes to, to prevent the uh, increasement of intracranial pressure. Antifibrinolytic that come with the, maybe with uh, prevent the re-bleeding and if there is hypothermia, hyperglycemia, we will try to prevent them according to these cases. Now we will look for the real treatment after we will prevent them. That is the practice guideline of the neurosurgery here. We will look for the most common uh, two things we have to do is the administration using of the nemaldepine uh, calcium channel blocker, using of the normal saline or, uh, and IV fluids and control of the blood pressure. That is the most important things. Now we, we prevent the complication, we manage this patient, so let's do the real treatment. The real treatment is according to the real complication, is the real bleeding. So to prevent the real bleeding uh, permanently, we will do securing this aneurysm. We will secure this aneurysm with coiling maybe or clipping according to the decision of the neurosurgeon, right? This thing will uh, prevent the aneurysm uh, re-bleeding, right? That is the practice guideline. Uh, talking about the time of the surgery, the time of the surgery have to be as possible as you can in the first three days. And if you, if you can't do it in the first three days, you have to wait to the third week because um, there is a high risk in this period of time for the vasospasm intraoperatively maybe, and this will lead to ischemia and death, okay? For that decision, if it's clipping or uh, coiling, it's, it's up to the surgeon, uh, the surgeon decision. And there's many of, of things considered in our mind, like the weapon or the edge and edge scale. If the grading scale was uh, poor, like four, uh, five, come not with the clipping. If, if it's come with middle cerebral artery, so that's good prognosis for a clipping. And if it come with elderly age, like above the 70, uh, that come maybe maybe with the coiling. It's it's not our job. It's the job of the decision for the for the seniors are and for the surgeons, right? Now um, we'll look for this case, real case. We are operated here. Uh, Doctor uh, Samer Hoss operated with uh, Doctor Anwar Nuri here in our hospital. Ruptured MCA in the bifurcation, and we can look here. There is hyperdensity in the sylvian fissure, right? And this is the angio. For this case, how it look on the angiogram, really uh, secular, very angry. This picture in the R for this clipping. Here is a picture for me uh, when I was on on real aneurysm cases here in Baghdad uh, Neurosurgical Teaching Hospital. We can look here for the clipping from above, from here and this one is uh, all our video. We can see uh, how we can do the the clipping here. It's a permanent clipping, but I just wanted to show how I want to demonstrate how to do the clipping for this aneurysm. Okay. Okay. Uh, now uh, we will uh, we now here for the last is slide is in our presentations. Uh, for now we secure the aneurysm so we prevent the re bleeding. Now we will look for the prevention for the vasospasm. The real prevention for the vasospasm is the triple H. Triple H is mean H and H and H. Hypertension induce the hypertension, hypervolemia and hemodilution, neuromycelium. So you can say 
hypertension, induced hypertension, it means increasing of the blood pressure that gives us the risk for the rupturing of the aneurysm, of, of the rib bleeding. But we do that after the securing of the aneurysm. It means we prevent the rib bleeding permanently. So now you can to prevent the second complication, which is the vasospasm. There is a huge body practice here to doing this triple edge before securing of, of the aneurysm to, to prevent the rib bleeding. So we have to do this after securing the aneurysm, and also we will use again the pneumodopine or, or the pneumodopine. And here is the practicing guideline talking about uh, that things. It's also um, come with our, with our, our talking. Hemodilution and treatment of the blood pressure and maybe to prevent the, the vasospasm, we will do this um, angioplasty. Other guideline, to, uh, this other guideline decision, sorry, to, to prevent the complication. This one is come with the seizure prophylaxis, uh, prophylactic. If there is seizure, you have to use a seizure prophylactic anti-epileptic drugs, right? And we have to use it in short term and some of the decision will be with the long term if there's previous attack of a seizure, there is intracerebral hematomas, and there is uh, hypertension, etc. of the process. It's up to, to the surgeon decision, right? If there is a hydrocephalus, if, if it was acute, the guidelines say you have to do EVD, external ventricular drainage, and if, if it was chronic, the guidelines say uh, you have to do a shunt, a peritoneal shunt, right? Now it's our last slide here. Uh, if, there, if there is uh, one of other uh, rape bleeding uh, management or for prevention, it's antifibrinolytic drug therapy. Maybe we can use it, but it's the most important one to control the blood pressure and secure the aneurysm. Okay. Now it's the last slide here. We show uh, MCQs, which is uh, the most important things we have to consider in our mind, to stick in our mind. What is the most important presentation of the SAH? We will look all of that, the real presentation of the SAH. But the most important one is the sudden severe headache, the worst headache in my life. What is the best treatment of the re-bleeding? All of antiviral therapy, yeah, it's, it's treatment, but it's for the prevention, not real treatment. Clipping for grade five with it? No, sure, it's bad prognosis. Triple latch, it's come with a vasospasm. Clipping or coiling according to the case, yeah, it's this one. Control of the blood pressure, that's for the prevention before the real treatment, which is the surgery. Now, uh, this is my final message here. Uh, 40 years old male presented to our uh, department with the vomiting, meningitis, all the sign of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And we see that there is increasement of the urea and keratinine. So we diagnose him with a multiple aneurysm. One is ruptured and one is not. Um, so we will look for his uh, CT, non CT. We look here, there is hyperdensity area, right? Maybe in the sylvian, in the interhemisphere fissure, and uh, so on. So we suspect that he has familiar disease like acute polycystic kidney disease, right? Because there's an increasement of the urea and the creatinine. We look here for the angio, yeah? two of aneurysm in the ACOM in the middle cerebral artery also. When we send him for this investigation, we look like this, huge adult polycystic kidney disease. So that come with our presentation to increase our level of suspicion. Now uh, we can say we're finishing our lecture. Why we are doing this lecture? We're doing this lecture because I'm, I'm really interested in this, in this uh, specialty and this uh, department. And also, as we see here, uh, this, this one, Emily Clark, that, that just a movie, uh, also has the ruptured aneurysm here. And here, how we demonstrate when she was on the, on the hospital. Uh, manage uh, her well and do everything good so she prevents the death and he was out with us right now right so subarachnoid hemorrhage and the ruptured aneurysm it's really really severe cases uh 50 percent of the patient will die after three months if we don't manage them maybe 10 percent will die before reaching the hospital but if we manage them well we treat them well they will be alive also right
Um, I will stop the share right now. Okay, but uh, I, I have uh, another another slide also. So my message here is we have to look for this for these cases, okay, and to prevent the death for many of peoples. And there is many many of celebrities here, like uh, Sharon Stone, Emily Clark, and this incredible guy. I, I didn't uh, remember his name, but I I know he is uh, let's say, a comedian. Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This one. This one. <laughs> right. Uh, also has a rupture in the aneurysm. So all of these guys have a rupture in the aneurysm. All of these guys suffering, but with the good management, now they are alive with us, right? So before finishing off my lecture, I have to really, really, really give a special thank, and I'm really grateful for this lab, Hose Lab, uh, Hose Neurosurgery Lab, the, the place that we, we learn, the place that we do a great simulation, the place that we have this opportunity from Dr. Summer. So there is a special thanks for Dr. Summer here. And I have to thank you all for the great listening and thank you for you, Dr. John, for, for this great opportunity to share this lecture with all of you. Thank you very much. And now I will turn the, the lab. Okay. I, I will stop the share right now. Okay, very good, excellent. You're Thank beyond you. the level of training that I was in in uh, medical school. Uh, ex excellent Thank presentation. You. And yeah, Thank just you. click on the stop share there, Ali, yeah. so we yeah. can uh, have some interaction here. Yeah. And I believe Samer's here. So just okay. uh, if you want me to, okay, I, I can, I can boot you. I will. Boot you. Now I will. I have to stop the show right now. Okay. No, I do it. I'll, I'll do it. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. You do okay, it. Okay. There you go. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, let's let's go to the panel first. Uh, I believe Samer is Samer here. He stopped in briefly. Yeah, yeah I can hear you right now. Yeah. Uh, are you here, Samer? My my colleagues here also. Oh great! Oh great! How are you guys doing? Hello, hello, Dr. John. Samer, you've treated the, you've trained this gentleman very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He's better than me by far. It went. I'm sorry, Samer. Hi, John. How is it? Uh, how are you doing, Samer? Excellent. I hope we continue this forever. The Iraq uh, Grand Rounds, uh, uh, certainly it shows well-educated students like that, what they can do. You give a great presentation that's going to be on YouTube forever. Uh, <laughs> so I hopefully uh, other students will take advantage of the excellent way he put that together. Um, Thank you. And, uh, Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, Actually, we have a new blood uh, in the neurosurgery this year, and uh, they are uh, trying, they will uh, uh, keep on uh, preparing presentation to be presented in the neurosurgical TV. Great. And this is the first time, and uh, I'm really thankful for Ali for this nice presentation. I think with a very good accent, understandable accent for all, I hope that. Yeah, I hope all medical students take advantage of it. Uh, now, uh, the, ha, anybody have any comments or questions uh, before I'm going to ask Samer a couple of questions? Um, any, anybody in the panel? I, I know what it's like to be a medical student. When I went to conferences, I was quiet. I didn't ask any question. <laughs> uh, don't worry. This is your platform. And uh, if you don't want to ask, that's fine, too. I'm just glad you guys are here. Uh, is that Anmar? There's a couple of you on the panel. Uh, Ahmed, do you have any comments or questions for Ali? Ahmed, I believe. Yeah. Go ahead, Ahmed. Are you there? Uh, I believe he may have stepped away. Uh, I have a couple of basic questions, and I'm not a neurosurgeon. Um, uh, can you, you may have touched on this, Ali, about the demographics of a subarachnoid bleed between like women and men and what ages they typically occur. What, what maybe Samer could help answer this question too. Uh, is, it, is it more females and males that are prone to spontaneous subarachnoid bleeds? You, you're muted there, I can't hear you. Go ahead. Uh, now I, I have to answer. Right. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, the female can uh, more commonly than the male in uh, three to two percent, like three female to, to two males. 
uh, in the subarachnoid hemorrhage. But when there is advancement of the age, when the age uh, is come bigger, I, I think it will come uh, with the female, with the male more, right? Uh, maybe Dr. Samuel will, will, will confirm this. This. Uh... Well, well, certainly the. Uh, go ahead, Samer. Go ahead, Samer. It's mostly female, as you say, and with the advancement of age, person come closer to each other. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what it, it can occur at, at a fairly young age. A, a significant portion appear at young age, correct, uh, Samer? Uh, they can occur in the 30s and 40s. The mean age for, for the subarachnoid hemorrhage is like 40 or uh, 42, 42 age for the subarachnoid hemorrhage, the ruptured aneurysm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, now, I, I know may, this may be a little specific, but patients on anticoagulants, you know, it's very common nowadays that the patients are on for heart problems, rhythm problems. Uh, and I'm sure there have been studies with arachnoid bleeds and patients on anticoagulants. Could you make a comment about that, Samer? Have you seen a lot of patients on anticoagulants that get these bleeds, or you really don't see too much of a difference between patients on anticoagulants and the normal patient population? Actually, uh, yes, you are right. Uh, there is a connection, maybe not a direct connection, with this type of hemorrhage, maybe other type of hemorrhage like subdural hematoma, uh, one of the main causes is patient being on anticoagulant. But uh, the rupture aneurysm, yes, it may facilitate the rupture or may increase the amount of bleeding. And actually, this lecture, John, I think you are uh, the perfect person to ask because the title of Ali was uh, for non-neurosurgeons. That's the idea. <laughs> well, you know, um, the uh, you know, I'm on two anticoagulants myself, and, and I worry. But I worry uh, that if I hit my head, I'll get a bleed. Uh, and I know there are other patients out there too uh, that are on anticoagulants. I kind of wonder about that. Uh, that they, you know, because you'll have spontaneous bleeds from your skin, just from a wound. And, and so I'm kind of imagining the brain that might occur also. Uh, well, another question, probably more for Samer than, uh, than Ali. Um, now, did you mention, it, is there a genetic component to this? Do the running families, there is a genetic component, right? You probably mentioned, I missed that. There is. Now, is it suggested that patients uh, at high risk have kind of like preventative CTs at a certain age to see if they have them, uh, like patients uh, that runs in the family. I imagine it runs in some families. That uh, is it suggested that they have a CT at a certain age just to see if they have it too? There is certain recommendation for screening. We usually uh, use the MRI for screening because it gives less radiation. Uh, MR angiography, you call it MRA, and uh, it's uh, usually recommended in patients with familial history of aneurysm, especially if more than uh, one first degree relative, that will be a strong indication to do a follow-up MRI every five or ten years, or every new type of headache. Okay, very good. Okay, anybody in the panel? Uh... <coughs> Have any comments or questions? Ahmed, I know you were there before. Uh, as you know, there's sometimes a connection problems, etc. cetera. Suhail, do you have any comments or questions? Possibly not. They're like me when I was in med school. I didn't ask any questions. <laughs> I just blended into the background. <laughs> okay, great, great. Uh, I really appreciate this and it's gonna be recorded uh, Samer, and we'll send you the, the edited version. And we look forward to seeing you guys uh, next week. <laughs>